and also for this specific opportunity to see how business opportunities and investments uh, can be made in, in, in Nigeria, in Africa, and in my case, in Nigeria in particular. So, so I think that, uh, first, I'd just like to say also that the theme, Equity for Africa, Transforming the World Through Judeo-Christian Values, is uh, insightful for two broad reasons. The first is that um, there is a need to apply Christian values in domestic policy and sovereign actions at the international level uh, and at, at, at the domestic level and also at the international level. The second is that um, these values, you know, and, 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 and I, if you just give me a, a moment to just reflect on these values, uh, values of integrity, respect for obligations, founded on the principle of let your yes be yes and your no be no, fairness to all, you know, on the principle of doing unto others as one would have done unto oneself, and social justice for all, because what we do for the least of these, uh, we do not just for man, uh, but for God. The upholding of human rights, because all men are created in his image, and there is neither, you know, as scripture says, neither Jew nor Greek in his sight. I think that fidelity to these values by nations in local and multilateral dealings, either intentionally or inadvertently, is responsible for much of the economic progress and peaceful coexistence that has characterized uh, socioeconomic success, especially since uh, the Second World War. And my view is that departure from these principles has predictably led to inequity, growing inequality between countries, and of course, uh, conflict. The second point uh, that I'd like to make is obviously that um, Africa, uh, in order to actualize its potential, must work with friends, especially those of faith, uh, to identify strategic opportunities to bring about the growth and prosperity uh, of the continent. I, I, I would just like to look very quickly at some of uh, the ways in which uh, Nigeria in particular uh, may uh, be uh, an interesting destination for, uh, for investors. Uh, first, uh, I'd like to say that, uh, that I found uh, in the Good News Bible you know, an interesting rendition of that uh, scripture in Ecclesiastes 11.1, 1, which says, Cast thy bread upon the waters, for thou shalt find it after many days. And the rendition in the, in the Good News Bible actually says, Invest your money in foreign trade, and one of these days you'll make a profit. So, so <laughs> I think that rendition is particularly apt, especially uh, for those of us who are urging you to invest in Africa, and in particular in Nigeria, uh, which, as you know, is the largest economy and the most populous country uh, in, in Africa. Ours is a, is a stable and functioning democracy of over 200 million people, very resilient and hardworking people, and a very versatile youth population. So what, what the government has tried to do in particular is to provide infrastructure and the right business environment for the private sector to thrive. Uh, this is why we've paid particular attention to promoting investments in uh, power, rail networks, roads, broadband, as well as air and sea ports. Particularly, our broadband connectivity for all projects by 2023 is one that we think is very important from point of view of technology and all of its implications. And perhaps we might still have time to uh, dive deeper into that uh, in the discussions. And then the completion of rail links between commercial centers uh, and further links to our landlocked uh, northern trading partners uh, in Nigeria. Now, what we've tried to do is that with our rail links, we've tried to ensure that we're linking from, especially the ports of Lagos, out into the hinterland, to the north uh, of, of Nigeria and to several other parts of the south. We're also looking at rail links to the landlocked uh, Niger Republic and several of the countries, our uh, northern neighbors, who do a lot of business with Nigeria at the moment, but uh, because they are landlocked, have to go through other seaports and all of that. So the rail link will provide uh, very interesting prospects for uh, further developing uh, trade. 
Uh, then we have a Presidential Business Environment Council, uh, which has been coordinating efforts to make it easier to do business in Nigeria. Uh, so through systemic changes, we've been making it uh, easier to register businesses, obtain construction permits, get credit, pay taxes, you know, get uh, electricity and travel in and out of Nigeria, etc. Prior to COVID-19, we were making uh, very steady progress, moving up especially in the World Bank's ease of doing business rankings by about 39 places between 2017 and 2020. And we're quite focused on improving the business environment uh, because, of course, we realize that uh, uh, investment has, uh, uh, there, there, there are several uh, attractive destinations and we're trying to ensure that we, uh, you know, first amongst the most beautiful uh, brides that investors may have. All these efforts complement, you know, our vibrant legal system and commercial efforts, which encourages innovation, protect property rights, and incentivizes investments. Our banks, our Nigerian banks, have a very wide reach domestically and across the African continent. As a matter of fact, uh, about two of our banks have bought into uh, banks in South Africa, in Zambia, you know, and I believe in Senegal. So Nigerian banks have a really wide reach all across Africa. And the services which they offer are also now being complemented by fintech solution providers who are increasing financial inclusion by enabling easier access to credit and making payments smoother and, and, and much faster. As a matter of fact, uh, we, 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 are, uh, we, we, we think that the fintech space is one that Nigerian entrepreneurs uh, have done quite well in, and there have been some uh, investments uh, by foreign entities, especially uh, quite recently, um, a Nigerian fintech company called Paystack was bought into by the US company Stripe. And um, I, I think for close to about $200 million, that was the value of that investment. You know, And um, we think that there is room for more of these types of uh, collaborative investments and we're uh, looking forward uh, to more. We also have a compendium just for those who are interested of investment incentives in Nigeria, which has just been issued by the uh, Federal Inland Revenue Service and the Nigerian Investment Promotion Commission. This outlines the various incentives that are available to all of the business sectors. One of them, the Pioneer Status Program, gives up to five years tax holidays in eligible sectors. Uh, of course, everyone knows that oil uh, is uh, Nigeria's uh, primary uh, resource, and it's helped us to build large cities, extensive road networks, bridges and pipelines, etc., and educate a large uh, number of our citizens, many of whom are now in the diaspora. But we have a conscious, <laughs> we have, we're very conscious that it's a wasting asset. And that the world is, is on the cusp of a transition to less carbon intensive sources of energy. So we are paying a great deal of attention to further diversifying the Nigerian economy, to deepen the contributions of agriculture, manufacturing, mining, technology, and the creative sector also, by adding value to our abundant resources and creating jobs for millions of people. So um, while uh, COVID-19 disrupted economic activity, we were able to, through our economic sustainability plan, which was a response to the fallout of COVID, uh, do a few things which we thought would be primarily aimed at boosting, uh, aimed at boosting trade, uh, aimed at boosting jobs, um, uh, uh, saving businesses, health interventions, and um, trying to find easier credit terms for businesses, payroll support, and targeted interventions in agriculture, housing, public works, and solar power. So just one example uh, is our solar power project, which is expected to provide electricity to 5 million households. And so we're doing 5 million solar connections in the next uh, uh, 12 months. And this means serving 12, 25 million people who are not currently connected to the national grid. 
What this means, of course, is several opportunities for solar equipment manufacturers, and they have been encouraged to set up production facilities also in Nigeria. And this is being done through concessionary financing and import duty exemptions, amongst other incentives. The project is crucial for us, you know, not only as an investment in renewable energy, with all, with all the implications for sustainable development, but it also means jobs for solar installers, maintenance electricians, operators of payment systems, and of course, bringing power to uh, the rural areas. But we also think that it's a very uh, viable investment opportunity for uh, businesses across the world who are interested in doing business in Nigeria. And we think that investing in Nigeria offers a pathway to partaking in the African continental free trade area, which will create a market in goods and services for up to 1.3 billion people. It's also a pathway to using the provisions of the African Growth and Opportunity Act, AGOA, to produce goods that can then be exported to the US under preferential terms. So the opportunities are vast, yeah, and it's not surprising that Nigerian business leaders who know the country well and appreciate its economic dynamics are making huge investments in oil and gas and agriculture and food processing, telecoms, power, etc. The Dangote Group, just as I round up so I give everyone a chance to respond, the Dangote Group, for example, is building a 65,000 uh, barrel a day refinery. That's the single largest uh, single line uh, refinery in the world. While the Boa Group has also initiated an investment in a 200,000 barrel a day refinery. In the same vein, Azura, Transcorp, which are all local companies and several other power companies have made large investments in, in power. Azura, for example, has uh, built a 450 megawatt plant, which uh, has been uh, in use now for a few years. Uh, I, I think I said the, the Dangote plant is 650,000 barrels, not 65,000 barrels, 650,000 barrels. And uh, I've already mentioned fintech. Uh, the, in the fintech space, uh, the uh, pay, pay stack, which was recently acquired, as I said, for $200 million. Microsoft has set up its African Development Center in Lagos. Facebook has also located its Africa hub in Lagos, where the Google developer uh, space is also located. Uh, a few days ago, we heard uh, about uh, Twitter has gone off to our friendly neighbor, Ghana, you know. So <laughs> we congratulate Ghana for winning, for winning over Twitter. But I'm sure there's more than enough space for Twitter to open other offices in Africa's largest uh, economy. So I think we'll just, I'll just leave it at that. I, I, just, just to mention, uh, sorry, that, you know, I, I thought it might be important for us just talking around the principles of fairness, uh, especially to people of faith, that there's, it's important to strive to build a fairer world, you know, one which takes into account the interests of the poor and the marginalized. And I think um, what this may mean is uh, how the world does, will not impose unfair burdens on developing countries especially where global cooperation is required. For, for example, uh, if you look at what has been happening with, the, with COVID-19 and uh, access to vaccines, what we're seeing are export bans and a resort to vaccine nationalism, which, you know, of course, uh, makes it uh, extremely difficult for developing countries to access uh, these vaccines. I think also there are, you know, uh, issues um, that, that we must address around uh, energy uh, just transition for you know uh, the, 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 uh, some of the energy initiatives that we have. Everyone is committed uh, to um, reducing emissions. Uh, there are various targets: 2030, 2050. But one of the very important things that we want to one of the very important things that we want to uh, do, especially those of us in the developing countries that are gas-producing countries, is that we think that it may be unfair to defund gas projects, as is suggested, as is suggested 
uh, by uh, already, as a matter of fact, some of the multilateral uh, uh, institutions are uh, defunding gas projects because they think that uh, this would uh, accelerate uh, the, the progress towards zero emissions. Well, we think that fair, a, a fair transition from fossil fuels to, to cleaner uh, to, to cleaner fuels, or for that matter, to, to non-fossil fuel-based uh, energy, would involve uh, allowing uh, gas projects, uh, especially in countries such as ours, uh, in a phased process, you know, that will lead eventually uh, to only renewable energy. But certainly not defunding those projects uh, now uh, without any kind of provision for the future. Final point I'll make is uh, to commend the U.S. administration that because they supported the increase in special drawing rights at the IMF, which will give more liquidity to developing countries. And uh, we hope that the IMF board will move speedily in this regard. We have been pressing very hard for, we've been pressing very hard for those drawing rights. We've been pressing very hard uh, for those drawing rights to be, to be, um, to be granted to developing countries uh, because, especially in the, in the wake of the fallout of COVID-19, what we experienced, uh, of course, was greater uh, problems with liquidity. But with, with, with this initiative, very, uh, we, we hope that um, IMF following up on it will have greater access to liquidity. So just to say again, thank you very much. I hope uh, that I've been able to pack as much as possible into the into these uh, few minutes. Thank you very much.